go along. So I'll just start with obviously some key mega trends, and I think we're all knowing that we're living in a VUCA world, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And uh, it's really how do we transform that into something a lot more productive for us. And I've actually got three buzzwords which I've had uh, coined over a span of last 25 years. And I uh, thought I'd just uh, talk about them quickly. First one is called simplexity. And uh, that's complex made simple, then collaboration, and then one called exploration. <laughs> so simplexity is the need for simplicity in an increasingly complex world, architecture, or ecosystem. And it's really about less is more in many regards. And it's deciding what not to do is also very important there. And I think it's, it's really the ultimate goal in many regards. It's about hiding the technology in the back end and enabling the benefits in the front end, which is what really matters at the end. And the second one being collaboration, which is open collaborative innovation. And I think it's self-explanatory. But what I really want to refer to here is it's all about transdisciplinarity, cross industry and multiple disciplines. That's what the world today really needs, that we really have to focus very widely yet we need to focus on certain specific domains. And it's really about local thinking as a call it, which is you know, thinking global, but acting local. And then experiation, which is really immersive experiential story from moving from passive storytelling to story showing. And I think that's where really we talk about, uh, you know, when you, a startup has a product, it's really about how they reveal that minimum viable product into something, what I call the M triple VP, which actually Guy Kawasaki talks about, which is minimum viable, validated, and valuable product, becomes the most lovable product, MLP. And that's when you're really experiencing something as a prototype, which some the end users can actually use. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we're really living in exponential times. And I think we've seen this world uh, you know, in such a new form that uh, I think the human mindset, human brain is really thinking more linearly. Whereas, and I think when you look at taking 31 meter steps, you've traveled 30 meters, right? So guess how much you would have traveled if you taken take 30 logarithmic or exponential steps? Anybody? <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> Sorry? Significantly. Oh, not more, yeah. So it is actually 26 times around the world. It's over a billion meters. <laughs> And uh, so that's the, the, scale, the space of change with technology. And I think it's really how do we uplift the human mindset to become an exponential mindset. And that's kind of what we are working on at Singularity University. And I think there are a few new folks to SU. So just talking about what are the key principles, we have six Ds of the, what Diamond, Peter Diamandis and Steve Kotler had put together. And that's really anything that can be digitized, goes through a phase of deception, can be disrupted, dematerialized, demonetized and eventually democratized. And uh, to give you an example of that, I'll, I'll talk in a minute, um, of some, some key uh, devices. But I think what's really important is uh, also for every organization to realize, in fact, be it a startup or a corporate <coughs> or an enterprise, that what business are you really in? So Kodak, I think everybody knows the famous Kodak story. What business were they really in? Anyone? What, what did they do? What was their core business? Selling the experience to the people, recording their memories. Perfect, perfect, yeah. And so what they originally thought, or what their board was so focused on, was selling chemicals mm -hmm. and selling uh, you know, photographic sort of uh, ingredients, right? But actually they were in the business of selling memories. Very true. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what many other companies that I've worked very closely with in my career, um, also having gone through similar Kodak moments. And I think a lot of companies are going through these Kodak moments in their at different stages of their, of their evolution. So Nokia, for example, I mean, it was such a big brand, you know, the largest player, the biggest uh, maker of cameras even. And uh, Siemens I worked with for four years, I was heading innovation for them for the mobile device division. And again, we were acquired by BenQ, went through chapter 11. Motorola, Nortel, I mean, so many of these companies have been through stages where they didn't realize that what was the real business that they were in. And look at that long-term sort of view of the uh, you know perspective, and it's no longer around about creating ecosystems; it's about curating them. And I think that's kind of some of the industry that I work closely in. It's how do you really take the best and look at the right segments that you want to target. And um, what we're really seeing is so talking about education and learning, right? We're really seeing that transformation happening from old school to a whole new world of learning, which is self-learning, which is multi-dimensional learning. And it's collaborative learning, as we call it. We see already thousands of, tens of thousands of MOOCs 
people know what books are? Massively on open online courses, which you can do like Stanford D School has and so many others. And it's, known, it's the flipped classroom approach. In fact, I've been teaching for several years now at different institutes, and I very much use that flipped classroom approach. And it's no longer about a sage on the stage, it's about being the guide on the side. And similarly in healthcare, we're seeing this democratization happen so rapidly. In fact, Eric Topol uh, from the Valley wrote this book called The Patient Will See You Now. In fact, he had a great article called The Smartphone Will See You Now. And that was really about uh, self-help health, health in your own hands. And I think we've seen that happen. And I've got one device here, which is very much proving that, something which would have cost you know, several tens of thousands of dollars, democratized for 400 US dollars. And that's, this is made by consumer physics. It's actually, a, imagine an electron microscope in your, at your fingertips. So it's a molecular, molecular spectroscope. And it actually, I can look at, I can point it to a piece of food, uh, fresh fruit, for example, and I can see how fresh it is. I can look at body fat, I can look at many other things. So you can even recognize pills. And it's a full app control. I can give a demo of that. Anybody interested? We have some fruit or some food at the back there. <laughs> um, so healthcare. <laughs> so we're really seeing that shift from sick care to health to true healthcare, you know, which is what uh, is being enabled. And I'll go into some of that with some examples in a bit. Um, so at the end, actually, it's all about experience, which is really everything. And being a function of hardware, software, content, and services, something which I've grown in my sort of telecom career, and then moving across widely, and I think the bigger companies very much exhibited that. But I'll tell you a bit of a story, which I was quite integrally involved in at the early phase of my career, which was working with a company called Nortel, a Canadian company, which I said, unfortunately, it doesn't exist with those divisions anymore, that were leading smartphone design. And we had a Skunkworks project called the Nortel Orbitor, which was this device here. I wish I had the prototype with me, but it was actually something which inspired, and 10 years later, the IP was bought by Apple. And then um, that's what sort of transpired into a key ingredient to become the iPhone. And uh, having worked closely on that, I had some great touch points with Apple, and it was really about simplicity springing out of the box. It was about a liberating experience. And how do you package everything together with iTunes, with the whole user experience, with Steve's, with, well actually both the Steve's, but most of Steve Jobs, his PR sort of brand equity. And then it was about the liberating experience through the touch screen, the multi-touch and the apps were the biggest innovation as part of it. And then of course there were other categories. Apple, of course, has never been first in a, in a major category. They've always been, but when they come in that category, they sort of redefine the rules. And the same thing happened in tablets. So Apple actually had a device very early on called the Apple Newton. I want to see a show of hands if anybody recognizes that device. Wow. So I used to co-chair the Apple Newton users group here in the early 90s, 92, <laughs> if anybody remembers that, called the Osnab, and uh, the gentleman called Robin Simpson. And uh, so that's when I had some great interactions with, with Woz, with Steve Woz here. And that product was so pioneering at that time, uh, the message pad 120 uh, later on, but Apple killed that. So again, there was a, uh, a big gap. 16 years later, it was reborn as the iPad, as you can see. Again, it created a whole new category with tablets. And similarly with the w Apple Watch. So when I was at Siemens, we showcased the world's first watch phone, which was twice the thickness of this, only 10 minute battery life, very poor user experience. But of course it took quite a while to perfect something and bring something with a lot more wow to it. And of course then the iPhone 10, and I've got more stories on that about design and so forth. Um, but wait, there's gonna be a lot more things. And I think as we've all heard rumors, Apple's been working on autonomous cars. They've got a lot of IP in, in electric, EV, in the combination of the future of mobility. And it's really about innovative companies creating that wow consistently. And design is not just how it looks and feels, it's how it really works. And I think that was the key learning from Steve. Now, my interactions with Steve in the early days uh, while working on the iPhone project were actually a touch point around spirituality, which was a great passion of mine, and bringing technology and spirituality together. In 1974, he actually traveled to India with his friend Potke for a month and a half, and to rediscover discover himself. And uh, he really started following Zen Buddhism and many other practices, which I think gave him a lot of clarity, and what people say has actually influenced him to create Apple, which of course on, was registered officially on 1st of April 1976 with the three founders. But Steve, anyway, his 
uh, just a different side on spirituality. His one of his favorite books was Autobiography of a Yogi, and uh, this was the only book which he had on his iPad, incidentally, and was the only book that was given to every well, well the book which was given to everybody at his funeral too. Um, okay, I want to come to now the wearable space. So everything from head to toe that can be connected, we're seeing some real innovation in the space. Um, the landscape is so wide. I mean, we've got so many domains, you know, right from fashion, right through to healthcare, sports, and many others, which are being sort of influenced by wearables, which are moving into a lot more meaningful sort of area. And uh, some of the companies that I work closely with, so I want to show you this one, for example, is for HK. It has pole detection, geofencing. So people imagine with Alzheimer's or dementia can actually wear a watch like this, a smart watch, and it will give you independent living, you know, pretty much. And it gives the carer uh, a lot more peace of mind. So it's really uh, giving a lot more, um, you know, sort of benefits through watches like that. That's another version of this watch. Welcome to come and see this later on. That's a 3G version of that. And then there's a version actually, which is also a smart soul. So imagine people who rip off a watch. We've got that in the as a soul, a smart soul. That's got a SIM card in there. It's got GPS, so you can actually hide that in your in your shoe, and uh, and track say the elderly person. Um, and similarly, on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. How often does that happen? Sorry? Tracking the old people. Tracking old people. Well, uh, I haven't been doing that. <laughs> but, uh, I think the capability is there. <laughs> We've got so many people suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. So that's yeah. kind of, yeah. And I think the other end of the spectrum is children, right? So being able to, there's a great startup here. We've got Ella Nation, which is again gamifying, uh, you know, a wearable for children. And there's another great startup I was recently mentoring at Murudi called Lubo, which is doing something very specifically in that for, uh, you know, monitoring children in theme parks and so forth through a very simple device. And I think it's true simplicity through even without a display and amazing level of, um, you know, precision in terms of tracking with the higher GPS capability that we have in there. Uh, we've got a lot of variables around, um, you know, this was a great company here called Sleepo, uh, Yoga Tights, which you can monitor, you know, uh, basically different parameters of how well you're performing yoga or different levels of fitness called Natty. Then there are, you know, a lot of research happening in uh, in sort of skin, e-skin type versions of wearables. We've got all kinds of different uh, technologies with SIM band from, um, which was really the real estate you have in your band of your smartwatch, having 13 sensors on there. And Samsung have this uh, entity called SIM band, which has been doing some amazing work in that area. And then uh, the company I work very closely in Silicon Valley called Neurosky. We've got something. So how many start? was Star Trek sort of fans do we have here? The tricorder, <laughs> yeah? And imagine something which can displace seven instruments a doctor would carry. So it does blood pressure, blood glucose, body fat, body temperature, oxygen saturation, and heart rate variability. You can come forward and see the demo or try it out. So that's going through FDA approval too. As a reference design, it's a prototype, and we've got a product there doing live ECG. I mean, even five years before Apple Watch Series 4 came in. So, um, so Neurosky has been working essentially in the in the brainwave space, EEG and ECG. Uh, I'll be talking about EEG in a, in a couple of minutes. And that's another version of the product which has a real cuff, uh, blood pressure cuff, which is this one. And the, the sort of uh, device which is formed in, in this smaller form factor. And now there's even a version of that as a smartwatch, which I'm getting next week in, uh, uh, in, in the Valley. So, and that another great startup we've had from Australia at, in Sydney Sports Incubator, which has really been looking at this, obviously, epidemic uh, of, uh, you know, one in five Aussies are obese. It's, it's an alarming, you know, statistic, actually. In fact, because that was so true in America, and but now we've really seen that come here. Uh, we really need to take quick action, and I think looking at how do you combine AI, looking at the right variables, monitoring the right things, it's really about making a hearable, a disappearable, and that's what these smart headphones are from this company called Bioconnected, which is helping you, and I can again show you the app uh, a little more detailed, the way it shows you the heart rate zones and motivates you through um, you know, conversational AI to help you, you know, achieve your goals. So it's been developed by a sports athlete, Dr. Sven Reeves here. Then we've got pain, wearable pen relief, which is this, where did I put it? Right here. I tense, 
and that's again another connected device in the in that space, which is doing some wonders. It's FDA approved device. We've got some great Aussie other startups looking at the tech gym, uh, at rehab, for example. Um, we've got different well-being, you know, elements. Spring Day. So I just wanted to focus that in Australia we've got some amazing startups, but they really are at at times struggling locally, and it's about how do we uplift them and take them really to that next level. And especially with hardware. In fact, one of the hardware startups sitting right here is Presso Displays, which Scott's got. And uh, you know, we're really trying to get hardware focus back in Australia. And I think that could be an interesting topic of discussion also later. And then we've got <coughs> health and wellness, sort of well-being, Brisbane being a great curated portal, where also we're looking at variables and so forth. And another one called Time Chi, which is using the Pomodoro method for time boxing. And um, I have that right here, and I can show you that. It's another great hardware startup from Cicada. And uh, one of the ones I was mentoring at Singularity U last year called Willify, Health Map, we were actually collating and even being able to show people in 3D what they could look like and not take the right action. So you can actually monitor a holistic view of what they can <laughs> make up. So not just from what they're wearing, but what they're eating, what their habits are, what their genetic makeup is. Imagine all that sort of coming together in, in a uniform. I've got a video on that, but I won't show that right now because of time. Um, uh, but so we, what we're really seeing is media evolve into a whole new format from 1.0, which is the lean back, sit back, relax, the couch potato mode, to a lot more engaged mode, which is your computer and so forth, to media 3.0, which is your Nintendo Wii and for the Natal, your you know, Kinect and so forth. But it's really something, and that's what I wanted to show you as the natural user interface. This device called the Ring. Right here. Imagine I can turn off lights just by pointing at them, turning the volume up and down, just by using gestures. That's a startup I actually funded five years ago through um, um, Kickstarter, in a Japanese startup called the Ring. So there's so much potential there. Um, wanted to come to my last sort of section talking about sort of brain waves and mindsets of the neurotech, which is uh, again an amazing space where so many interesting applications are, are there. I mentioned about Neurosky, which has really democratized the brain computer interface to a level of, you know, from tens of thousands of dollars right down to sub hundred US dollars. For $99, you can buy a brainwave headset, the Mindwave Mobile, which has been available for the last, in fact, eight, nine years now. And um, uh, I'll do a quick demo of that, actually, of some live brain waves, <laughs> to give you a perspective of what the capabilities are. Right. So I'm just going to switch to my phone. So Scott's wearing that uh, device with just the single channel. Um, that's it. And Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So yeah, so what we're seeing here is a live view of Scott's brain waves, your raw alpha, beta, delta, gamma waves. And uh, what you're seeing here, the two different dials, attention or focus, and meditation or relaxation. And look at his attention there. Wow, that's amazing. So it's something <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'll ask him to relax a little bit, just breathe in slowly and nicely, and, and then um, or close your eyes a bit. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Back. So when you actually get both these dials working together in harmony, uh, you know, in that direction, you can have people put them into the zone, as they call it, right? And that's what athletes do. It's a lot of mind over matter. When you see tennis stars and all, it's, it's that pressure that builds up, right? It's about how effective they are with their controlling their brain and, their, and being in the right mindful state. And that's kind of what you, the capability of what you, I'm just showing you a very raw, rough example of a visualized brainwave here. 
but there are applications of this. So, I mean, I can do this uh, later on if anybody wants to try that out. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. But I'll show you one other example of uh, one, one I've got my phone connected, which is Sleep Shepherd. So th uh, this product, I mean, this gives you a sleep score, and it's this device right here. So it's in the band format. It's actually got, um, and I've got a slide on it later, but uh, I'm sure explain what it is and all. So basically, you've got two speakers here, which uh, which plays binaural beats. So it actually gives you, uh, and it works on a uh, you know body alarm clock. So it actually can put you to sleep quicker and helps you to wake up to your natural clock rather than. Uh, a specific clock and it even measures your uh, sleep uh, through a sleep lab as you can see here and it measures your deep light restless awake state your REM sleep for example you can look at trends you can um, uh, you know sort of look at your which way you slept it's got accelerometer gyro in there so it's this is a, it's got a, a fairly old version there's a newer version which has a lot more sophisticated which i'll be getting in very shortly and again there's a lot of these new variables which just wanted to put a plug in that we have our Singularity U Summit coming up, which I hope you all are going to be, be part of. And I'll be doing a variable tech fashion show there, which will have a, some of this, but a lot more uh, newer, refreshed gadgets and things which as part of the variable thing there. So let me just switch back quickly. Probably a bunch of other demos, but given time. So yeah, so, uh, let's see if this works. Let's this works. <coughs> so, we've had a lot of games at Neurospy. Star Wars fans. Imagine being able to control any object with your brain waves. And that's what's very possible. I mean, the, this is there's a lot of toys and things in that space. Um, you can look at so many different industries, you know, that you can in fact, as I was talking about health and wellness, looking monitoring sleep you can there's a flying helicopter which also i actually have but i didn't bring that <laughs> today with me but uh, you probably see that at the uh, at the summit for sure and uh, many different applications and there was an interesting toy which became the top seller toy in japan apparently and uh, a company called zero way it's a bit of mechatronics a robotic headwear <laughs> I can tell you some good stories about this. With a lot of new CEOs wearing this in some of my workshops, actually, in uh, different parts of the world. But yeah, and photographs being taken thereof. Yeah. So yeah. Any questions? I'll just try and wrap up. So I was talking about the Sleep Shepherd there earlier, uh, and then we've got other products. So imagine, and that's why. So this one, driver fatigue, is one of the biggest killers on the road, right? Yeah. So imagine the truckies who are driving for forever, and uh, to take them off the road or to monitor them, you can actually use brain waves. And a product like this by a company called SmartCap. So that's embedded in the helmet, say for uh, workers out in um, uh, you know in the construction industry or people who are truckies who can be in the SmartCap format. And you've got a simple score of fatigue, and and the moment it sort of goes from there to there or so. It's ready to take them off. You can even disable the truck remotely. So and that's something we've been looking at. So imagine combining that facility with, uh, you know, uh, a company called Gopar, a startup here, which I've been mentoring. And what we've been doing with them is really looking, connecting any, making any car into a smart car with this what's called the OBD port, onboard diagnostic port. It's like a USB port in the car, and we're able to look at, uh, you know, the, the internal computer sort of uh, elements of the car and connect that to say something like this and being able to control different elements of the, of the vehicle and monitor the performance of the vehicle and also the driver behavior especially. 
and looking at how fast they're driving and, and many other different parameters. So um, there are many other different headsets. Emotive is another great uh, Aussie founder's startup, looking at uh, you know multi-channel EEG with facial expression. Then we've got uh, Muse. Somebody people might have heard of that, which is meditation. There's Muse too has been out for a little while now, which is really helping you with uh, again meditation and relaxation. And uh, it's really about how do you tap the right state. And I was involved with setting up a lab in India, which was kind of the world's first uh, you know thinking lab. Uh, innovation thinking lab, and that was um, called iZone, and this was in the place called Gurgaon in outside Delhi, uh, where we really looked at putting people into the right state and measuring their state, and then doing the right brainstorming exercises for innovation. So there's a lot of potential there that uh, one can do for looking at creative intelligence being one of the real key parameters we were talking about. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm just. Uh, and then one other key area that's really moving, I'm talking about measuring your brain waves here, which is really a read capability, but imagine being able to write to your brain with a very low induced current, and that's what TDCS is doing. So it's called transcranial direct current stimulation, and we've got a great startup here, which is called Lumbre, called Incap Neuroscience actually now. So it's fortunate to be mentoring them at Remarkable Accelerator here for the disability tech. And we've been looking at cerebral palsy and how do you impact people with uh, disability to actually get their motor skills back and so forth. Um, but, and I'm sure some of you might have followed a three-year-old startup, uh, one of the, again, little great features of Elon Musk, which is called Neuralink. And uh, what they're essentially doing is 1,100 the size of a human hair fibers being injected into your brain through kind of non-invasive type surgery. And you're able to then get a very precise and more accurate control into your brain and being able to look at, uh, again, a similar aspect, but taken to a much higher level of capability. Uh, so yeah, I think it's really about how technology enables magic. And then we've got other products out there, uh, like Halo Sport, which is also using TDCS capability to help you with your sports performance in, in, in this area. And Halo 2 was just recently announced. Another product that I've been more recently and actually been involved for a while, but now we're reviving it to the next level, is something called Intuition Pro. And uh, unfortunately, Professor Hamlin couldn't make it, but he's planning to come today. Um, working with him on this device where we can help people improve their intuition, their gut feeling, through electrodermal activity or your galvanic skin response. In fact, we can measure stress using that similar technology using this device called PIP, which is an Irish startup. Um, so yeah, I think the future is already here very much, and it's just a, not evenly distributed. So I'm saying it's converting that VUCA we talked about to a new VUCA, which is being having the right vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. And it's about, uh, I think it's a lot more about humanity. And I love this saying by John Nesbitt, saying the most exciting breakthroughs of the 21st century will not occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. And I always end my <laughs> quoting the Mahatma, that true collaboration would only happen in what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. Thanks, guys. Any questions or something? Or any questions? Or anybody had a? Sorry, I was going really fast. I don't know. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Uh, Go ahead. I'm curious, what sort of obligations do these startups have in terms of transparency? 